A shepherd's primary responsibility is the safety and welfare of the flock. I'm speaking of shepherds who do this for an occupation now. So you can see some of the ways that God and why God talks about us as sheep and elders as shepherds. You see, some flocks may include as many as 1,000 sheep. The shepherd will graze those animals, herding them to areas of good forage and keeping a watchful eye out for poisonous plants. I didn't know that about sheep. They'll just eat we know they'll eat anything, but you never think about the poisonous plants the shepherds have to watch out for. Imagine watching 1,000 sheep looking for poisonous plants and other things that come along. Talk about a job. As the sheep eat all the forage in an area, the shepherd will move the sheep to a fresh range. And in most cases, the shepherd and his dogs will move the sheep out to fresh grazing each day and bring them back to bed down in the same area every night. To protect the sheep under his care, a shepherd may use guard dogs, may even use some other guard animal, which I thought kind of interesting because you always hear of sheep dogs, but you don't hear of like something like a sheep cat. <laughs> Just saying. Okay? But sheep predators include coyotes, wolves, mountain lions, bears, and believe it or not, Domestic dogs, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, are, the more, are more of a threat than any other larger predator. Now, they're more of a threat because they see a toy, a fluffy little toy, and they chase the sheep down to exhaustion, even to the point of causing the ewes to abort their lambs. So in addition to using guard animals, many sheep herders carry rifles to shoot predators and domestic dogs that are attacking their sheep. Like other animals, sheep are susceptible to diseases, and so they must be monitored for the diseases and must be monitored during the lambing process. They can also be bothered by insects, some of which carry diseases that will harm the sheep. And so shepherds are often responsible for minor injuries and basic medical treatment because they work in such isolated areas far from the services of a veterinarian. In addition, shepherds may administer worming medication or even vaccines to the sheep. And they apply insecticides to a sheep's head occasionally. During the lambing season, the shepherd will make frequent checks on the ewes and may even assist the ewe if birthing problems occur. Glamorous job. Anybody want to become a shepherd? <laughs> Unlike other animals that shed hair in, in the springtime, many breeds of sheep must be shorn. Anybody ever seen the shoring of sheep? It's quite a process. They have to have their fleece cut off with shears or clippers, and the task may be assigned to actual sheep shears who make a living out of it. However, if they're far out and can't get to a sheep shearer, say that ten times fast, the shepherd is the one who's responsible then for shearing the sheep. They can be sheared anywhere, in the open, in holding pens, and they don't work well in the shearing process with the sheep shearer. However, an experienced shepherd is expected to shear up to 125 ewes a day, according to the Mountain Plains Agricultural Services. Shepherding is not glamorous work. Sheep, we know, we've heard, they're not intelligent. They're stubborn animals. Matter of fact, if going into a pen and the shepherd is bringing all the sheep into a pen and he sticks his staff out and the first sheep jumps over and then he pulls his staff away, every sheep going into the pen will jump, even if the staff is no longer there because they are highly, highly, said sarcastically, intelligent animals. They're stubborn. And all throughout Scripture, God calls his own sheep. Not something you're, it's not the, I mean, think, if you're going to pick an animal that you wanted to be affiliated with, sheep is not at the top of the list. I mean, think about this, all right? Mascots, cougars, tigers, panthers. Can you imagine, we're the Warsaw sheep. 
I mean, that just doesn't, it, it, it's, not, you're not, it's not there, right? But that's what God has chosen to identify us as. And he is the great shepherd, and he has put under shepherds in place to care for his stubborn, unintelligent sheep. To care for us, to protect us, to do the work of the shepherd, elder, overseers, to do an unappreciated, non-glamorous, often lonely, hard work. Last week, we started looking at what that work includes. And this week and next week, we're going to see some of the responsibilities, not all, but some of them that are included in the work of an elder. This week, we're going to specifically look at the protection aspect of the elder's work in regard to individual sheep and the entire flock. So to get an idea, to start us off, to get an idea of what this looks like for a shepherd on any given day as an elder of a church, I want to show you a short video of a pastor who's dealing with a remark that he saw on social media by one of his parishioners, needed to go have a conversation, but that particular parishioner did not want to talk to the pastor. So watch this. somebody else to pull you out of a mess because you kept digging yourself deeper and deeper into it. We're looking at the different aspects of the bishop elder pastor role and doing a quick overview of some of the main responsibilities that are part of that role. So we're going to be in a couple different passages uh, over the next few weeks because scripture does not lay them all out in one. It would be nice if the Holy Spirit would have put them all kind of right in the same place, but he wanted to make sure that we studied the entirety of scripture so he scattered them throughout. So we're going to begin today where we left off last week in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30. So let's stand for the honor of the reading of God's word as we begin looking at some of the aspects of the elder shepherd's role. Remember, Paul was talking to the elders of Ephesus. They're in Miletus, in that coastal city. And he just got done talking about his role, and now he focuses on them, and he says, verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves. And for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Our God and our Father, we ask you to bless the preaching, the reading, the hearing of your word. You have promised that when your word goes out, it will not return to you empty. And so we stake our entire eternity on that promise. That the word of God goes out, comes into our lives, and we respond to it in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you, Almighty Father. And now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. My God, my strength, my Redeemer. It's in the precious and wonderful name of our great shepherd, I pray. Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. Hopefully you've gotten an outline that you can follow along with and a pen to write with. If you need either one of those, raise your hand and someone will grab that for you quickly. We can see here in Acts 20, 28 through 29, the word be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. Paul starts off by telling the elders from Ephesus 
to be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. Now, there is a lot that goes into guarding oneself. There is accountability. There is setting up parameters. And we don't have time to go into all what elders need to do to guard themselves. But some of which is just simple things that when they guard themselves, they're protecting the flock. And so something that the flock needs to understand is that sometimes an answer to a question or an answer to a plea is sometimes no, not because there is not the need, but because the elder has to guard themselves or they're of no value to the flock. There's more on that that we could get into. If you have questions on that, feel free to write a question on your Connect card, and I'll be happy to sit down and explain that to you. But what we want to do today is focus not on how the elders protect themselves, but on the ways the elders protect the flock. It says, be on guard for yourself and for all the flock. The elders have to be on guard for the flock. Paul uses this pastoral term to express protection and guarding. The best way to probably think of it, and probably most likely what Paul had in his mind when he wrote this, is thinking of a group of shepherds on the back of a Judean mountainside with their flock of sheep. The sheep are munching on grass and throwing some herbs in there to get some different flavor for their, for their morning munchings, and they're eating and just going about their day in a rather carefree fashion, but the shepherd is not carefree. He's constantly vigilant. He's looking. He's scanning. He's watching for thieves who would rob from the flock. He's watching for wolves that will devour the flock. He's watching for dangers, poisonous plants, and, and other things that would threaten the flock. You see, the job of the shepherd does not end. Even when, in that day and age when the sheep went into the holding pen, the shepherd would lie down in front of the way they went in. He would lay down across the the front of the wall in the small opening and the shepherd became the door. Anything to get the sheep, if it was coming through the doorway, had to go through the shepherd. And so the shepherd's job never ended. He is constantly watching. He's constantly checking the health of the flock. He constantly ensures that his flock is fed and secure. He knows his sheep. He recognizes their needs. And an elder operates or should be operating in a similar fashion. But to do this, one of the things that elders do is they ask questions of the flock. They have conversations with them so that the elders can ascertain the grasp the flock has on things like the gospel. How does the gospel apply in my daily life? Their understanding of theological terms like justification, progressive sanctification, those types of things the elder is trying to to make sure that the flock understands. And what that then means is the elder then can help them where the flock needs to be going and how the flock needs to be growing. If he doesn't know or they don't know, they have no way of helping the flock as a whole. You see, well-fed and well-cared-for sheep have less reason to wander from the fold. We got, we got our sheep over here. Don't be like Bob, trying to go every direction that he wants to go. Let the shepherds lead you to the Word of God. Now, that being said, it's your job to then eat on the Word of God. And not just Sunday. And not just midweek when you're in light groups or one-on-one -on -one with each other. But individually, read it. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Study it have devotions in it, live within the realm of the question marks you have as God brings you to the next step of the journey to understand it on a different level. But when it comes to the truth of the gospel and the truth of scripture, listen friends, elders cannot budge ever for anyone. When someone asks a question and the elder goes to the scripture and the person responds with, yeah, but, there is no yeah, but. We're not going yeah, but hunting in life. We're going to the word of God and this is what it says, period. Well, I don't always like what it says. I don't always like what it says either, but this is the word of God. 
and the elders cannot budge. Standing on the promises, standing on the authority of the word of God. Here is what it says. Too little in our churches, in our Western culture today, do we hear, thus says the Lord. But here, I am grateful for a church and for leaders who are in training that say, this is God's word. Thus far as it brought me, thus far will it take me. I have no other map for life than what God has placed, period. And so if we're going to protect the sheep, we have to know the word of God. We have to stand on the word of God. We have to proclaim the word of God. And we have to live the word of God. Somebody said, that's right. Paul uses strong terms to describe what's going to come when that doesn't happen. And even when it does happen, the attacks are still coming. Be clear. You stand firm on the word of God, attacks will come. You don't stand firm on the word of God, attacks will come, but you'll fail. Are we, are we together on that, church? Look at the terms that Paul uses here in Acts chapter 20. He says, in verse 29, I know that after my departure... Wolves, right? No. He says savage wolves. There, there's a difference between a, a, a wolf pack that feeds because it needs to and a wolf that has gone rogue. Think of it as I did what they had there. It's a rabid wolf. It's foaming at the mouth. It's savage. It's coming in to attack. And it's knowledgeable of where it's going to attack. So it dones what Jesus said, sheep's clothing and gets in, and because sheep are so highly intelligent that we saw earlier, right? They don't recognize that it is a savage wolf among their midst. He calls the predator savage wolves. He depicts the, the, the church as, as a flock of helpless sheep that are being just torn to bits under the attack of this rabid wolf. Christ used that same imagery when he talked about wolves donning sheep's clothing as religious leaders coming up and then taking people off and deceiving them. The whole idea of what Paul is talking about here is made a little more clear in Titus chapter 1. So turn over there with me to Titus chapter 1 and we'll see what Paul kind of expounds on this to the young man Titus in Titus chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Titus 1, 9 through 11, coming to the end of the qualifications, he says about the elders, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. For there are many rebellious men Empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Especially those who should know better is what he's saying. And what's he say next? Who must be silenced. That those are harsh, strong terms. The elder's job is to silence those who are teaching and, and wrong doctrine and, and, and taking the sheep a place where it's ungodly. What are they doing? They're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach. And some of them teach for the sake of money. What, what is he describing here? He's describing what we would call a wolf theology. What is a wolf theology? A wolf theology is teaching that in any way denies the deity of Jesus Christ or the co-equality of the Trinity. It's teaching that substitutes anything at all for the sufficiency of of the death of Jesus Christ and the atoning for our sins. It is teaching that denies the need for God's justice being satisfied in order for sinners to get saved. In another way, it's making your own way. That's, that's, that's wolf theology. It's like the old Frank Sinatra song that Elvis made popular. I did it my way. That's wolf theology. You don't get to do it your way. There is no place for the self-made individual at the foot of the cross. Wolf theology is teaching that robs God of his glory by insisting that salvation is not totally a work of God's grace. In other words, it's a denial of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, so that no one can boast about it. A wolf theology 
denies the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I love the refute to this one. I was listening to a friend of mine preaching recently, and he said this. He said, think about this. Jesus' friends buried him. If Jesus wasn't dead, they would have took him to a doctor, not a tomb. Think about that for a second. Your friends don't bury you alive, right? If your friends are burying you alive, folks, you need new friends. <laughs> are, we, are we clear on that? It, wolf theology says Jesus didn't rise from the dead full in his body. It was just a spirit resurrection. The Bible says no. Wolf theology claims to have revelations that are not contained in the canons of the Old and New Testaments. If you were in life groups this morning in Sunday school, you just learned about that as you started Galatians and James. Very clearly, Paul says, if even an angel from heaven comes and says anything other than the gospel, let that person or even an angel from heaven be damned for all eternity. That is the word anathema. It is a God's condemnation, God's damnation on someone. What is God's condemnation? It is the totality of the lake of fire. And that is what wolf theology teaches is, ah, no big deal. I got some new revelation. I got something more, something new. Well, all the way back in Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. It's all old. How old is it? How old is scripture? Well, the last scripture page was written. No, scripture was written by the Holy Spirit and he's eternal. It's as old as before we as a human race were even thought or conceived of on this earth. Wolf theology is teaching that insists upon some kind of work, some kind of self-denial, some kind of ascetic practice so that you can improve your standing before God rather than simply resting upon the merits of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And a lot of times, that is what happens after salvation. And folks, too many of us get caught up in this idea of wolf theology in even doing good works inside the church as if I can do anything to make God love me more than he already does. As if there is anything that you can ever do to make God love you less. He can't. He won't. You don't have to improve your standing before God because without Christ, you have no standing before God. You are lost on your way to an eternal lake of fire, an eternal death. But when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, your Savior, that he is God, that you are not, that he is in control, that he paid the price for your sin, that he was buried according to the scriptures, that he rose again according to the scriptures, you have complete sonship and daughtership in the family of God. What more can you do? Nothing. Because you cannot gain it on your own. You did not earn it on your own. You cannot lose it on your own. Wolf theology is dangerous to the church and it is the elder's job to protect the flock from wolf theology. And it takes discernment and understanding human nature and understanding the word of God to see these, these wolves that come in and just go slightly off and, and try to take the word of God and subtly shade it to something it doesn't mean. Meaning that God never intended for it to happen. And so if elders neglect to read, study, and meditate, and obey the word of God, those elders will become weak, and the flock will be in danger. Only strong overseers can withstand the pressure. Only the living power of the word of God can give elders that strength to be strong. The strength needed to protect the flock from false teachers. Because I can tell you, Time after time after time after time, when an elder tries to stand in his own strength, he'll fail. Every time. Because Satan wants nothing more than to have the elders fail. We have seen it again and again and again and again. And that's why we need to be in the word of God and on our knees before a living God. But the reality is when wolf theology comes in, whether by your own merit or by an outside source, elders must act 
simply because God has given them the authority to lead and protect the flock. They, they, they do not do this work on their own authority. Since the Holy Spirit placed elders as overseers over the flock for the purpose of shepherding the church, they have the authority to act as the shepherds and overseers that the Holy Spirit has appointed them as. They are under God's authority as his under-shepherds who act in accordance with their God-given shepherding authority to protect the flock. And the main way they do that is to stop false teaching. New Testament elders are both guardians and teachers of sound doctrine. You see, every local church needs to be a gospel lighthouse, a gospel missional agency, and a gospel school. Hence, for the local church to be ridden with heresy and false teachers is unspeakable, and friends, it's unacceptable. Watchfulness of congregations demand the elder being attentive to the church's theological understanding. When a church, and especially the elders, neglect theology, cracks form in the church's foundation, and ultimately, when there is a lack of sound theology, it affects the practice of a church. This is why we take so seriously the teaching of theology. It's why we have an entire life group set aside for the teaching of doctrine and theology. It's, it's, it's important. It's, it's what God, I mean, the reality is you cannot have a faith without theology. You cannot understand God without studying God and even when you study God, he's so far beyond us, it will take eternity to even come close to his shadow. And so part then, when the theology goes off base, part of the protection of the flock includes the discipline of the flock. We're in Titus. Turn over a few pages to chapter 3 and look at verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. So that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. What things? It goes on. But avoid foolish controversies, controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law. For they are unprofitable and worthless. Stop there for a second. You ever meet someone who just wanted to argue just for the sake of argument about anything and everything, including the Bible? I love this one. Well, you know, in Leviticus, it says you can't eat shrimp. So if you want to knock on my tattoos, you eat shellfish. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I get you. When was the last time you read the Bible cover to cover? Uh, well, I, I, I haven't. Oh. Okay. But it can't really be trusted, you know, because it's been translated multiple times out of multiple languages. Oh, okay. So, so... Now, you took a philosophy class in college, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You read Plato? Oh, yeah, yeah. In the ancient Greek? What? You read Plato in Greek in your philosophy class. You opened the Greek version that was originally written in on the scrolls it was originally written, right? Well, no. Well, did you trust that the writings there were from Plato? Well, of course. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this one? Now we got them hook, line, and sinker. You know, Plato's been translated into English. He didn't speak English. England wasn't even really populated all that much when Plato was writing. <laughs> and the English language wasn't around. So you're telling me you're going to trust Plato, but not this that's had more scholars translated than any other book in the world? What do you usually get from people like that? Well, you know, I want to you want to do lunch? I gotta go, I got an appointment, right? Avoid, avoid the argument for argument's sake is what the passage is saying. You don't need to become a good debater. You need to become a good gospel proclaimer. Look at verse 10. He goes on, it says, reject a factious man after the first and second morning. What's a factious man? Well, Psalms and other places in Scripture say anyone who is destroying the unity of the body. If you've told them once, and then the elders have told them twice, they are to reject them. Why? There's a comma there. Knowing that such a man is perverted in their thinking and is sinning 
and are self-condemned. Those are some harsh statements, aren't they? Good thing I didn't write them. The Holy Spirit wrote this. But we don't follow this. We try to make sure that we just love everybody back to Jesus, but God's Word says discipline has to come. If someone has been uh, warned one or two times, what are those one or two times? It's referring back to what Jesus set up in Matthew chapter 18 for church discipline. You go to them, you take someone else with them, now you bring them to the church, and you excommunicate them. What does that mean? That means they can no longer come and take part in the Lord's Supper. That means we treat them as they are unsaved. You see, there's this whole idea that excommunication means to, to just, uh, just be mean to them and cut them off from everything. Folks, how do we treat the unsaved? We treat them with love and kindness and the gospel so that they will get saved, right? So when excommunication happens, that's what the Word of God is saying. Treat them in a way that will bring them to Jesus Christ in full restitution by the blood of the cross through the resurrection of the tomb so they're one again as Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. It is holy love to leave people out so that they don't condemn themselves at the table of the Lord. And so that's discipline. And serious shepherd elders, they end up spending considerable time dealing with people's sin, people's failures, the offenses. And quite frankly, it's not a part of the task, it's not a part of the shepherding job that most men naturally like. But it is an indispensable element of spiritual care that must take place. And caring for people's spiritual welfare is stressful work. Some of you have tasted this a little bit. If you have children, and especially if you have children who've walked and wandered away from the Lord, that's stressful on you, isn't it? Now, take that to the next level if you can possibly imagine where a shepherd is dealing with that on a church-wide basis. It's emotionally draining. It's time-consuming. It's often monotonous. And it's discouraging. And it requires a great deal of personal dedication and personal sacrifice. It is one of the reasons why part of what Paul said to the Ephesian elders is shepherd yourself. Protect yourself. Take time and let Jesus wash your feet and spend time at the feet of Jesus because you will be drained again and again. Just as there was a Judas in the Twelve Apostles, there are Judases in the church that are to be loved, and hopefully they will know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. A godly shepherd gets after stubborn sheep, and, and a godly shepherd will refuse to fall into a shallow service that dishonors God. Friends, if the wilderness wanderings of God's people, the Israelites, were for anything, it was for their critical, complaining, anti-authority spirit, which God hears and then refuses to tolerate from people. And so don't be that person who is constantly critical, who's constantly complaining, who's anti-authority against the shepherds, because God refuses to tolerate that in any of us. But when it happens, it falls on the elders to step into someone's life. A friend of mine talks about how, you know, a church and in church, what should be happening is we should all be up in one another's business. Now, we don't like that. We like people to stay out of our business, right? But in community, we're supposed to have our noses in each other's business. And he said this, he said, I love how he puts it, he goes, and the elders' noses need to be longer than the people's noses. It gives me great satisfaction to know that my nose can be longer. I don't know if it's long or not, but the reality boils down to elders need to be able to stick their nose in people's business. And church leaders who fail to admonish God's people because they're afraid that the people will leave the church or stop giving financially, those church leaders dishonor God. They disobey his word, and they fail miserably at spiritual care. So Paul then admonishes 
Timothy. Turn to the left in your Bible, a few pages to 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, and look what he says to Timothy. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. On this idea of church discipline, James Denny maintains, quote, we should love and honor those who put their experience at our service and warn us when in lightness of heart we are on the way to make a shipwreck of our lives. They do not admonish us because they like it, but because they love us and would save us from harm. And love is the only recompense for such service. Friends, godly elders crave the day when the flock is fully mature. They take their protective responsibility seriously, never yearning to engage in church discipline. Elders set their sight on the faithful teaching of the Word of God. And if discipline is needed, they do it. What is the ultimate goal? That we may all come to full maturity in the things of Christ. And so part of that protection is discipline. And then finally, the third part of protection, quickly this morning, is teaching. Turn one page, if you need to, to the left in your Bible and look at 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul calls the church the pillar and support of the truth. And so therefore its leaders must be rock-solid pillars of biblical doctrine or the house will crumble. An elder must be characterized by doctrinal integrity. The failure of church elders to know and teach the Bible is one of the chief reasons that doctrinal error floods churches today and drowns the power and the life out of the church. It's one of the points that Paul makes in Ephesians chapter 4. He says that the church has been given apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers so that the day will come when we're all mature and we're not shifted by every wind of doctrine that comes about. What, what does that mean? That means, listen, we know as elders that there are a lot of good preaching and teaching at your fingertips on a daily basis, podcasts and others. There is also a plethora of horrible, unbiblical, anti-Christ teaching at your fingertips. And if you don't understand the difference between them, then come ask. Find out who your leaders are listening to. Find out who they're learning from. And find out if the ones that you are listening to are godly or whether they're shaded and they're teaching a wolf theology. You see, good teachers work hard at long hours of study and preparation and demanding teaching situations because they understand that teaching is absorbing work. Some of you are teachers. Some of you are teachers in a career. Some of you are teachers in management. Some of you are teachers in uh, our, our life groups. You understand that teaching is mentally strenuous, that teaching is time-consuming work that demands a great deal of strength and self-discipline. That's clearly the point that Paul makes later in this chapter in verse 15 when he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. It's why we take teaching so seriously from the nursery to the pulpit here at this church. It's why not many are allowed to be teachers. Because they have to be doctrinally sound and self-disciplined to make sure they're going to teach you can't walk into a classroom on two hours of study and be prepared for the questions that come out. First teaching situation I, I had when I got out of college was with a, a, a group of inner city boys as my small group in youth group. And the, the theme for that year was, was purity. I am single, about 20 years old, about six inner city kids coming from broken homes. And we kick off with purity. You can only imagine the questions that the first week came at me. I'm 
not going to mention them here, but if you've been in youth ministry or you've had, had teenagers, you, are, are we together on some of the questions that flew at me? I was not prepared. So I said, that's a great question. Um, tonight's kickoff, so let's talk about what we're going to do this year, and I'll get back with you on the questions next week. I learned very quickly, you need to study for the question that might be asked, not the one you know is going to be asked. Together, teachers, on that? The relationship of doctrine and practice is tied so closely to the leadership of those in charge of God's flock that the Lord alerts his under-shepherds that a time of accounting will come. We saw this last week. Hebrews 13, 17, if you want to turn there with me as we close out. God alerts the elders that you're going to be held accountable. We looked at this from a different perspective last week. Let's look at it from the elder side. Verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 11. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable to you. From the elder perspective, there's a portion in there. We keep watch over the souls God has entrusted to us, who he shed his blood over, and we will give an account for them. It is serious work. It is not to be entered into lightly. It is draining work. And God says, you will answer to me for your entire flock. For everything they did. For everything that they thought. For the life that they lived. You're going to give an account for how you shepherded. So those of you who are thinking eldership, who are yearning that, count the cost. Be sure that that is a calling on God's, God, God's calling on your life. Protection, discipline, and teaching, folks, they all go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. To pastor effectively, the congregation needs to respond to the teaching the protection and the discipline in a quick and godly manner every single time. That's to be an effective pastor. Now we know that that's not going to happen. And so we don't strive as elders to be the effective leaders. We strive to be the responsible leaders. To pastor responsibly means that the teaching, the protection, and the discipline when it is needed happen and continue regardless of the way that it is received and responded to. So this brings us to you. Your role in this. Are you following and responding to the teaching, protection, and discipline in a way that this is the conversation that happens in heaven? Jesus sees the way you act, think, talk, respond. And he turns to his father and says, Father, you see this child of yours? Look at that. Look at what they did. And the father says, well done. Well done. That's my kid. Or are you responding in a way that the father goes, I am totally ashamed that they would call on my name. That's not the way they're supposed to. That's not what I have for them. That's not what I desire for them. And now I must discipline them. If you're not responding in a way that is glorifying to God, I have good news for you. You can repent and start fresh. Forget what lies behind. Live from this moment forward in the way that God both requires and takes delight in seeing his children. But before that can ever happen, you first need to be part of the forever family of God. There must have been a time in your life when you recognize that Jesus is God. That you are a sinner. That Jesus, as God, fully God, fully man, died on the cross according to the scriptures. That he was buried and rose again three days later according to the scriptures. The scriptures are very clear. How do I become part of the forever family of God? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be rescued. Trust. Admit it. Admit that God is God, that Jesus is God, and that's all you need 
Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Well, pastor, you know, I'm just not, I'm just not qualified. Friend, none of us are qualified. Well, you don't know my story. That's right. And I don't need to know your story because the man that we were reading who wrote most of the letters this morning, he murdered the church of God, men, women, children, and God took his life and he saved him and he became a pillar of the church. Well, you know, I just think I need to clean up. You can never clean up good enough to get to God. There's nothing you can do that can make yourself, your good works that you do trying to make yourself clean is nothing more than an extension of your own selfishness trying to make yourself. It is grace you need. It is mercy you need. So fall on it fully 100% today, I beg you, and turn your life to Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus, I beg you, repent if you're not living a life that is pleasing to God and start fresh today. Our God and our Father, we are amazed at your mercy, your grace, the sufficiency of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Nothing is needed for us to come except for us to say, I'm done. Not only am I done, but I am undone. Forgive me. I trust in you as my Lord and Savior. Father, there are those of us who need to repent, who need to make the conscious choice to turn away from our thoughts, our ways, our attitudes, and turn to godly ways, godly thoughts, and godly attitudes. And at any given moment, Father, any one of us is there. And so, Father, we confess that we don't always follow you the way that we should, and we repent of that. Help us to live lives that are completely pleasing and glorifying to you. God's speaking to you, and you'd like to come speak with someone or pray. I'll be here at the front. There's those that can take you into a side room. There's places to pray, places to kneel. Whatever it is God's doing in your life, as God speaks, you come as we stand and sing.